Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back to Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy. It's so good to see y'all. Welcome back. I'm so excited about my guest today, but I'm going to prolong it just a little bit, do my little housekeeping thing. Don't forget to listen to us through Linktree. Every first and third Thursday is a new Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy, with yours truly, Dr. Toy. You can listen to past and upcoming podcast in the link tree link. Click there. And don't forget about the Ask a Therapist segment. Send in your questions. Y'all been sending them in and they are some good questions. I'm not going to lie. Okay. So I will answer those questions on air. If I do answer it on the podcast, you already know what you're going to get. You get your free Starbucks gift card. Everybody wants that, right? Yes, I want it too, but I won't tip off the top. So I will not belabor the moment. I will introduce our guest. This has been a plan in Dr. Toy's brain for months and months, and it came together. And I am so ecstatic to have a friend and brother here today. All right, here we go. I got to give this grand introduction. So Leon Ford is here today. I know. Hold on. Calm down. (laughs) Leon Ford is an author of this book and Unspeakable Hope. Y'all, I felt like I read it in like a day. I tore this book up. It was a page turner. It was so good. And I don't promote anything unless I think it's good. So um, you can get it at Amazon, all the major bookstores, walk in and see it on a shelf. It tripped me out. All right. So that's how you can get a hold of that. Leon has been on Good Morning America talking about his story. He's an author, an activist, a social entrepreneur, international speaker, y'all. And he's here, uh, I know, in Healing Overflow. He makes changes. Listen, he's been through tragedy to triumph using his power of forgiveness. Um, He's committed wholeheartedly to bringing healing in the community um, and just positivity through his story beyond, beyond, beyond. He took it beyond the realms, y'all. And he's here to share it with us today. I'm elated. Can y'all tell? Okay. All right. I got to calm down. I'm elated to have Leon Ford here today. Put your hands together for Leon Ford. Ah, <laughs> They're going, <you>. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you for accepting. Listen, I, in, in the Healing Overflow family, y'all know, I've been working with survivors of various crimes. I mean, from sex assault to homicide to shooting victims for over 20 years. And what I've noticed, and I shared this with Leon, what I noticed is that people that sustain this type of trauma become superstars. They become, you know, uplifted and magnified in a way that you're like a celebrity to people. But then if you think about it, what has happened to you is traumatic and that's nothing to be a celebrity about. And what I noticed, right, right? What I noticed with working with the population is that people often don't get an opportunity to know who you are until they hear about what you've been through. And so my first question is right off the top. Like, who is Leon Ford? You were Leon Ford before the world knew about your book, before the world heard your story. I even knew you as the Leon Ford in the book before I got to really know you as a beautiful human. Uh, so thank you. y'all need to know who Leon Ford is. Go ahead. Yeah, tell us. I, I would say I am a creative, you know, I'm a loving person. Uh, I'm very optimistic. I am a... Um, a source of uh, strength and inspiration. I've been that before this happened to me. Right. I've been that person in my family who has just been like, you know, optimistic and loving. Uh, I had a conversation with one of my cousins uh, because he thought, he said his grandma, like I was his grandma's favorite. Uh, His (laughs) grandma's uh, my grandmother's sister. And, um, I thought about that. I was like, no, I'm not her favorite. I'm just the one that checks up on her. (laughs) Right? And so I've always been, since a kid, like, I've been the person who would check up on all my relatives, you know, uh, call my cousins, call my aunties and my uncles, and just uh, spread love and, and, and positivity. I mean, from the first day I met you, I believe that because you're such a loving person, such an inviting, warm person. The smile, Uh (laughs) y'all. You're like, who is this? Like, what is with the smile? But it's genuine. 
Like you're a real, genuine, real person and you wouldn't know what you've gone through until you read the book or until you hear him speak. And so that warmth, you draw people to you already. That's who you were before this all happened to you. Why you are here is to talk about what happened to you and how you triumphed over that. And so let's just get down in it. Absolutely. And talk about um, what happened to you. You spelled it out. The way the way the book is laid out, I love it. Um, because you started off with like, look, here, this is what y'all here for. Yeah. You know, this is what happened to me. <laughs> Here's the stuff. This, yeah. Here's the stuff. You put the meat and potatoes up front, and then you said, now pull back and get to know who Leon Ford was. I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. <laughs> All right. What happened to you, bro? Yeah. So when I was 19 years old, I was shot five times by a Pittsburgh police officer. As a result of that shooting, I ended up uh, becoming a paraplegic. Um, I was also facing up to 20 years in prison, which... Is the reason why I became an activist. You know, I didn't become an activist because, like, I was, like, for the movement. Mm, and, like, right. I, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, in fact, you know, part of me, like, when I reflect on when I was 19, I, I wish I would have gotten involved before I was shot because maybe I wouldn't have been shot, oh, you know. Wow. I remember when George, I mean, George Floyd, um, uh, Jordan Miles, when Jordan Miles was beat up by the police and, like, he didn't hang out with us. You know what I mean? He was, like, yeah. you know, he was, like, a Kappa kid, mm -hmm. right? That was, like, my mentality back then, you know? Um, and I remember there being, you know, um, protests and rallies and mm -hmm. marches for him. And I never got involved, you know? And, uh, and so when I was shot, I was like, I have to do something about this. Absolutely. And... I was able to, you know, share that story, you know, with with my peers and 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 people within the community to say, hey, like, before this happened to me, it you know it happened in a different way to Jordan Miles, and I didn't get involved in. Mm. And so, wow. it's important for us to get involved before it affects us personally, like, or our families, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's why I, you know, kind of leaned into activism I really was fighting for my freedom and um, I wanted to encourage people to get involved before another person was shot or beat by a police officer Wow okay so this 20 years is surprising me what are you talking about with you were you were charged you were going to do 20 yeah, years I, w I was charged. Yeah, and so that, but you were shot. But I was shot. Well, Leon, okay, and, yeah. explain for us because yeah, we're so, in a little shock here. Yeah, so I was charged with, you know, several felony offenses, um, you know, resisting arrest, um, mm -hmm. uh, assault on you know police officers. Uh, they just, you know, stacked it up. Yeah, just stacked it up, and um, yeah, and it was scary, yeah, you know. But for, fortunately. Um, I was acquitted of all those charges, and um, and you know, and then the the district attorney, the, the so I was acquitted of most of the charges, and then the district attorney ended up dropping the rest of the charges mm -hmm. about a year later. Uh, but it was a fight, and it took <clears> several <throat> years to get to that point, right? And right. Uh, but st but my journey wasn't over, right? Because I still had the civil suit against the city and went through a lot with that. I sure. mean, you know, it was a lot of stress, you know, reliving uh, that experience over and over again through telling a story through trial, um, through depositions. Uh, I remember, you know, the city subpoenaed my social media accounts because they were trying to get more it's information. More and wow. yeah, it was a very... Uh, dark time for me, and I was struggling mentally. Uh, one, you know, I would question God, like, why? Why would you allow me to survive if I wasn't going to be able to walk? Sure. You know? That's real. Um, and then, you know, I was just angry. I, I was thinking about um, retaliation and, and revenge. Um, and, you know, and yeah, there's a song by Kanye West. I forgot which album. It was, but he says, um, 
I, I love myself way more than I love you. And I thought about killing myself. So. <laughs> right. 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 And that was just the state of mind you were in. That was the state of mind I Absolutely. was in. Absolutely. And I, I knew I loved myself. Yeah. And I thought about killing myself. Therefore, if I thought about killing myself, you can imagine, you know, what I thought about doing to these police officers. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and I was real. I was in my mind saying, before I ever kill myself, I'm going to take one of them with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where I was mentally. Yeah. It was a very extremely dark place. That's dark. And that's that rage. But there's another song. I love somebody to quote songs because yeah. I'm right with you. <laughs> Public Enemy, y'all. Uh, I'm a hip hop head. Um, has the beginning of a song, you're quite hostile. I got a right to be hostile. My people have been persecuted. Like, mm. that is the beginning of the song. And when I read your book and when I hear your story, when you speak, I say, oh, you got a right to be hostile. You were shot five times by somebody that was supposed to uphold the law and protect. And then they charged you. That's new information for me today, y'all. I'm not acting. I'm like, wait, you were charged as well? And so you had the right to be hostile. And that's where you were. You were in that place where you weren't going to hurt yourself, but somebody going to hurt because you were hurt. So I'm imagining, too, that people were like, well, he shouldn't have did this. He should have did that or he wouldn't have got shot because people in general want to believe that bad stuff don't happen to good people. And so Absolutely. bad stuff must happen to bad people. But y'all just heard he's not a bad person whatsoever, you know. So how did you deal with all the talking like, well, he should have just why didn't he listen to the he got to get out of the car that all yeah. of that. Well, in the, in the beginning, I just focused on I, I was so focused on. One, not going to prison. Right. Uh, two, physically healing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then healing mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Right. So the noise didn't even matter to oh, me at that point. Good. I think, uh, you know, as my I, I went further into my journey, um, I think that I, I became more aware of the noise Um once I be began to evolve as a leader, right, and I just looked at it as not noise but perspective, mm. you know, and I believe that people are entitled to their perspective. And wow. um, we all have a different lived experience mm. and different relationships. I was in Europe and uh, I was having a conversation with a, a, a friend of mine who really felt safe around police officers, right? And that wasn't my lived experience sure. based on how I grew up. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my first experiences with law enforcement was when my dad was um, indicted by the FBI and they kicked in the door and, you know, I cut up furniture and, you know, did all those sure. different things. And um, that was extremely traumatizing for me as a five-year-old, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then my first time, you know, being detained by a police officer, I believe I was maybe 10 or 11 years old uh, because we, we were having a water fight at a park. And uh, one of, you know, uh, a neighbor who lived near the park called the police on us because we got her car wet. Right. And uh, wow. and the police came and, and detained us. They handcuffed us, set us on the ground, questioned us um, and those things. And so with. You know, those experiences shaped my perspective of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And um, my per, uh, perspective of law enforcement was rooted in, you know, dislike, fear, and, and hatred, mm. you know, uh, and distrust. Um, and so when you have that perspective, you respond in a particular way. Sure. Um, and, and so it's, it's, and it's not to say somebody else's perspective is invalid, you know, because if, if someone may be from a different, you know, uh, neighborhood with a completely different socioeconomic uh, background, and they may feel safer with police. And so uh, they may feel comfortable getting out of the vehicle and uh, the, the thought of them being beat up, shot, or killed, um, doesn't even cross their it's mind. It's the furthest thing yeah. from my mind. And and thank you for explaining that. That was something um, I had to even learn because I grew up 
with, you know, police came around the neighborhood, gave us stickers. And like, hi, Toya. Like, you know, and, it, and they did protect and serve um, like most police officers do. But then um, now I'm noticing if you speak against the, the police that are not the good police, then you're against all police. And that's just not true. Because we have different perspectives and different upbringings where my friends who lived across town in the inner city were treated like you described. They're pulled out their cars and mistreated where that never happened in my neighborhood. So I didn't understand the anger towards police until, again, music, you know, NWA and just through hip hop, they start telling us about police brutality. And I said, wait, that's happening? Like, people are being treated like that. We get stickers on my street. Yeah. It was very naive. But I love the 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 perspective and the maturity that, that you have, even been through, you know, being paralyzed by a police officer, being mistreated, being called racial slurs. It's all in the book, y'all. Like, it was... It was overwhelming to read. For you to make that transformation is unbelievable for me. Like, I'm a therapist, and I'm like, whoa. Like, what What made that type of growth for you to say, all this happened, the trial and even in the way you would want it to get, quote, unquote, justice. And that's a whole other conversation yeah. about justice. Like, what in the world would propel you to say nine years later, I want to meet this man that caused me so much pain. I like to do that. Like what? Yeah. Why? <laughs> so at first it was like family. Like my family just loved on me through this entire experience. Mm -hmm. uh, community loved on me. Many different aspects of community. I'm talking about like one, like two of my biggest supporters, and I wrote it in the book, mm -hmm. um, before Black Lives Matter like blew up, work uh, the Quakers and the Nation of Islam, yeah. which are two completely different totally. <laughs> organizations. Uh, but they just embraced me. They loved on me, and, you know, they supported me. They showed up in so many different ways. Beautiful. Um, and so I had a very diverse groups of, of communities um, just pouring into me. And that really, you know, challenged me to grow. That challenged me to evolve. Um, challenged my perspective. I remember waking. I remember uh, being in the hospital, and um, you know, looking at the comments of about me. Uh, and so, I never f framed it like a black and white thing. But when I looked, you know, I'm not. I was 19. I go online and pull my name up, and I see black teen shot by a white police officer, and I read these comments and. You know, I don't recommend people to read those comments because they they were so racial Ooh. and yeah, they were the worst. Yeah. Um, and so I told myself like, yo, I hate all white people, oh. and I really believed that until like my nurses and my doctors they treated me so well, and I'm like, well, I hate all white people but them, <laughs> right? Um, and then you know, uh, I always you know talk about my sixth grade teacher, uh, Miss Shank, because. She really, she, so she was my sixth grade teacher, and I was like teacher's pet, right? She was like my mom in the school. And um, like sixth grade, seventh grade, all the way up to eighth grade, she just like loved on me. And when my sister passed away when I was in the eighth grade, she really like leaned in and did whatever she could to keep me engaged in school. Wow. Um, and so I just never forget her. Um, and so when she came to visit me, I thought about, like, man, I don't hate Miss Shank, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, I, my grandma Betsy was my granddad's wife. Like, I love her. And and then I realized it's so complicated and nuanced. <laughs> sure. Right? And so sure. oftentimes it's easy to say, like, we hate this thing or we hate these people. But when we think about the relationships that we have and the people who may get grouped in, to those people we hate, if we're not careful, uh, we realize that wow, I, that I don't. That's not my reality. That's not my truth. It's not real, right? Yeah. Um, and so I realized that my truth couldn't be hate. Wow. Right. Uh, because I was just, you know, a loving person, and uh, my family, my friends, community, and those relationships, those people who leaned in and and loved on me, really helped me get back to my essence. 
uh, which has always been love and you know positivity. Wow. And, uh, and so I was able to find myself. And I believe that, um, you know, I believe that people are good people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also believe that we are culturally conditioned and conditioned by society uh, to pick up different perspectives and likes and dislikes and, you know, and different ideas that may oppose who we are at the core. For sure. You know, and so um, having a loving community around me really helped me get back to my core and let go of, you know, these different ideas that I had picked up along the way. Wow. So love healed you. Absolutely. The love, the love from anybody, no matter what they look like or, or what religion. I love that. Like they, they loved on you and gave it back to you. I see you doing that now. Like Absolutely. you're loving on the community hardcore. You're loving on people that have been hurt. Um, do you think it could have happened? And let's let's go to that day that you met with the officer. Yeah. Do you think it could have happened without the meeting? But first, tell us about that. Like, you were so detailed in, yeah. the, in the book. Um, I was surprised because my husband's in the book. <laughs> I didn't know Cordell Jones was in the book, and he was there. I, I do know he was there because yeah. he came back from from that meeting like he saw a ghost. Like, he was so inspired and, and just overwhelmed with emotion and touched by what happened. Um and so I kind of have that inside scoop about what it was like to be there. But I wanna I wanna get in your brain a little bit. Like nine years later, you I think I wanna meet with the officer today. Like what you got to that point, you went to the hotel and met with them. Tell me what that was like. Like we wanna we want to be there, like, in your head and yeah, body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I will back up just a little back bit. Back up. Do what you got to do. Because <laughs> I didn't just wake up and decide that, right? <laughs> First, like, there was a lot of self-work and building relationships within community. Oh, yeah. And uh, a few things happened. One, uh, my big bro, mentor, Reverend Cornell, he began working with the Pittsburgh police and be, like knew this guy right and was around this guy and never knew this guy was the officer that shot me wait I didn't know that either so he was around the officer and didn't know that that was exactly the get out of here Leon this is too much and so when he found out I was the officer that shot me Whoa. he basically he came to me like yo bro like I didn't know that this was this person, and I've been working around this person. And, and y'all have all y'all had already cultivated a friendship, family life. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so. <laughs> Why are you surprising me, on? <laughs> <laughs> and so this was around a time where there was a lot of healing going on. So um, I ended up meeting uh, one of my mentors, John Henney, mm-hmm. uh, and we always go to lunch, and like he's just amazing. Great guy. Oh Thank yeah. You. Um, and so John, he was like in a space where he's raving about me to people. Um, and so while he's in that space, I uh, telling people how amazing I am. I was triggered by the George Floyd shooting and something that Bill Peduto said when he was the mayor and uh, Chief Schubert said when he was the chief. And I went on social media and I called them racist and said they didn't care about black people and all these different things. And you did a Kanye West. I did a Kanye West. <laughs> and so Dan Gilpin uh, apparently reached out to John and said, yo, you're always saying he's a positive person. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's up with this? <laughs> you know? And so John reached out to me and was like, yo, like, I don't think, you know, Bill's racist and, you know, and would you be open to meeting with him? I was like, yeah. And so John set up a meeting between Dan Gilman, Bill Peduto, and myself wow. in his office. And we just, it was so much, so much healing happened. Mm-hmm. Like, I was just talking to Bill Peduto, like, texting Bill Peduto last week. Wow. And I saw Dan Gilman twice this week, right? And so it was like, it was like real. And Dan Gilman's position was what? So these are for folks that aren't. Yeah, so uh, Dan Gilman was the mayor's chief of staff. Okay. Right. And the mayor was Bill Peduto, y'all. Yeah. That was the old mayor. Okay. And, and so, um, so we met and we began like this healing journey, but like, and it was it was like 
a very honest, open meeting. It wasn't like a political, I would say what you want to hear, you going to say what I want to hear. It yeah. was like deep healing oh, and deep relationship building to the point, like I said, we were texting last week, wow. right? Wow. Um, and then Laura Ellsworth, who I met through John Henney, reached out to me and she was like, have you ever sat down with the chief? And at that time, I had not, and, and she organized a meeting with the chief, um, Scott Schubert, and uh, we had an open and honest conversation and began our healing journey. And I love it. That, I love that everybody was willing to sit down, and I'm, I love that you were willing to sit down with these Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because I was talking about healing and these things for years, but it was time for me to, to be about what I was talking about. Got it. You know, it's easy to read a couple books and feel like you're a Buddhist monk, right? <laughs> I'm healed. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm healed. Meanwhile. <laughs> what, without doing the work, right? It's you, work. You ever, you ever see work. some of those, you know, some people who, you know, they could tell you every scripture in the Bible, but they can't forgive their sibling. Ooh. You know Ooh. what I mean? And, we felt that one, y'all. And, and yeah. so, you know, I, I think it's important for us to take this wisdom and, and apply it. Sure. The application of the wisdom, is, to me, is more important than memorizing it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so I wanted to to model um, healing, you know. And, and so, uh, and, I, and then I had these relationships. And so, you know, from Brother Cornell, you know, doing his job, being in those spaces, talking about me, you know, then be, meeting Bill but. Bill Peduto, who was the mayor, and built a relationship with him, and Dan Gilman, the chief of staff, and then like Laura Ellsworth taking me around, introducing me to people, and meeting with, you know, um, Scott Schubert, the chief of police, um, Commander Raglan, uh, Diana Bucco was instrumental okay, in, great. you know, making these connections. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it was like the community literally like cultivating this healing journey and like nurturing the healing yes. journey on all sides, you know, people talking to me, people talking to police officers, some people talking to uh, Detective Dervish who shot me. And this was going on for about a year and a half. Okay, there's a lot of moving parts there. A lot of uh -huh. moving parts. So it wasn't like I just woke up like I want to be here. <laughs> and there were people who were very protective of both of us. Mm -hmm. Right, who are making sure I was ready to meet him, and who are also making sure he was ready to meet me. Yeah, right. And I remember saying that to Cornell. I was like, "No, no, you got to make sure he's ready because that could re-traumatize him." Like y'all know it. I'm a, I'm a trauma person. Like, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. They they have to talk to make sure he's ready. So I'm in the background too. So, yeah. Community. <laughs> community. Right? right. And 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 so I think that was the power of that conversation. Right. Like community. Huge. Played such a huge that's role. That's big. And that's people big. that I didn't even know was in, like you. Yeah, right? yeah. Getting in the, the back, scenes, like, so. yo, you know, <laughs> and your influence and language to make, you know, Brother Cornell think about, all right, hold on, man, we need to talk to this person or we need to, you know, and, and you know, even Commander Holmes was involved, right? And, wow. and so, like, everybody was working to make this happen for about a year and a half. Wow. That that's bigger than that's bigger than like anything that we can imagine. You know, the community and people in these par powerful positions. You being in that powerful position of being that voice for what has happened to you. Y'all all come together, and and healing was happening all along the way. Absolutely. And then at that hotel, healing was like exploding. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we were both prepared for that moment. Yeah. Uh, again, over, like about a year and a half in the making. And, um, you know, Brother Cornell made sure he was there. Uh, Commander Holmes, now Chief Holmes, um, mm -hmm. made sure, you know, he was there. And, you know, we were really able to, to, to dive deep, you know, into what healing really looks like. And, um, you know, I, I share it with, you know, Detective Derbish and, you know, uh, Brother Cornell and, and uh, uh, Chief Holmes. This feels like something out of a Bible. <laughs> like because a Bible story. It did because it's like, you know, these types of things don't happen too often. 
You know what I mean? Um, and I recognize that, you know, I, I'm, at this point of my life, I had been in therapy for several years. And so I had the language to articulate myself. Wonderful. Right? Uh, and, you know, police officers could be very aloof, right? Um, because, you know, from my experience with them, I don't think... Um, I don't think a lot of police officers have safe spaces to really share how they feel, sure. right? Um, and it's uh, it's unfortunate. And so, um, although you know he didn't say like yeah I apologize or anything, uh, what was bigger than that was you know the sincerity in his eyes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and, and his his um, admiration and you know willingness to to listen and lean in. Um, it was it was so powerful. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah, it was so powerful, and um, you know he, you know, voiced that you know he wanted to you know get more involved in the work, and he shared how in many ways I inspire him. Wow. Um, which was you know you know really really powerful, and um, one thing that I took away, and you that I really believe this uh, makes this that meeting so powerful is because um, it, it it served as a model for restorative justice, right? And, you know, even Commander, uh, well, Chief Holmes now, he's uh, chief at Duquesne University. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, I've been in you know, conferences, I've read every book about restorative mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. and, and healing, and I have never been a part of anything like this. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and that really resonated with me because, again, we could talk about it. And even some of the, 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 the most famous practitioners may not be able, <laughs> right, <laughs> to forgive some people who, you know, harmed them. Yeah. And let alone forgive yeah. to meet and have a, you know, open an honest dialogue uh, about, you know, the incident. And, you know, from my perspective, um, I thought it was really important uh, for us to meet and talk because I felt like we had the answers. Yes. Right? Like, yes. wh what is the, an like, how do we prevent uh, another police shooting like this? And, and so my mind went to, like, from a psychological perspective, when someone doesn't feel safe, they experience uh, flight, fight, fear, and fawn. Yeah, right? very good. Um, <laughs> fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And freeze, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and so I was afraid, and I had to own my perspective. I was afraid, and I decided to drive off, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, thinking of objectively, and I have this, this a, my mind works in a very, in, like, interesting way because I'm able to think like I'm able to acknowledge my personal feelings, right, and then separate that as a leader, mm. right. Separate my personal feelings as a leader. So my personal feelings, I felt you know different ways mm -hmm. toward him, mm -hmm. but uh, me being objective as a leader, thinking, okay, what is the solution to this uh, problem? How do we prevent this from happening? I thought about the shooting objectively and 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 in a way where, um, like, if this officer says he didn't feel safe, right, and he decided to shoot me, what does safety look like, mm. right? And safety looks different for a 19-year-old black male on a dark road who Absolutely. was stopped by Absolutely. these police officers than it does for a police officer with a badge and a gun. For sure. Right? But in order for us to prevent this from happening, we have to figure out an, an innovative way to make each individual feel safe, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and who, other than some a police officer who shot somebody and someone who was shot, to have an honest conversation of, around safety to get to a solution? Yeah. Right? Um, and I, I did acknowledge, you know, to him, you know, I, I said, uh, you know, I know that my attorneys, you know, encouraged me to, you know, to frame my story one way and your attorneys encourage you to frame your story <laughs> one way. And um, now there's no attorneys involved. He could 
get to be real. The real. And that's right. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and I, I believe that, you know, many solutions that, you know, many issues that we have in our country can be solved with us being honest. Uh, but some of those issues uh, were prevented from being 100% truthful because of the legalities of yes. the, the situation. And people... People afraid to be wrong. Like, I need to be right. And oh, so I yeah. need to say it like this and keep it like that and stay here with this. There's no other there's no other way, is what I'm hearing from you, that this healing and this forgiveness could have taken place um, unless you made the decision. Because you were in that rageful, somebody going to hurt because I'm hurting, particularly the person that hurt me, um, I anger, all that, which I, I still believe you had the right to feel all that. And I still feel it sometimes. Okay. Like, you know, forgiveness is not like this place you get to. It's and not you're magic. Like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> like, yo, I made it. You know what I mean? I, may, I might wake up tomorrow like, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. That's real. That's real. But I'm committed to the work, right? So commitment to healing, like, Embracing it and acknowledging the anger, the frustration, mm -hmm. the heartbreak, the sadness doesn't mean that you're not committed to healing. You know what I'm saying? And, and so I think it's important for people to give themselves grace because we can have this idea of who we are supposed to be and how we are perceived and then box ourselves in. And then one day we feel angry we feel like we, we, we failed ourselves or we're not good enough or somebody's going to judge us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a huge advocate for individuals feeling every emotion because feelings are involuntary. You know, it's what are you going to do with it? Right. Now, I'm not right. saying get angry and go beat somebody up, but it's completely okay to be angry and to feel it fully and to say, wow, th this person, you know, may have violated me. Now, What? how can I move forward from this? And those emotions should be validated, not squish down and act like you're not feeling it. And just because you feel it doesn't mean you're still not on that healing journey. Exactly. It's like that's actually means you're on the healing journey when you're acknowledging how you feel. Exactly. You said something in the book that I was like, I got to quote this, y'all. Uh, I have learned that acceptance is a huge part of healing. I may not want to admit it, but I am a paraplegic. I've lost my ability to walk. I can live in denial or I can choose to accept this reality while working hard to change my circumstances mentally, physically, and emotionally. Healing is a choice. That smack me in the chest, y'all. Healing is a choice and a choice that can significantly impact our lives and the lives around us. Page 222. Two, two. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, healing is a choice. You broke it down so well when you said the emotions are where you don't choose what you're feeling, but you acknowledge it, you respect it, and you nurture it. Then you choose, what am I going to do with these emotions? Absolutely. And it's important because here's the thing. When we live in denial, what is the solution? Like, we tell ourselves these lies, right? Like, what is, there's no way to find a real solution. Like, solutions come from truth. Right. Right? Because when you acknowledge a reality, like, this truth is my reality. Um, me acknowledging the fact that I'm a paraplegic and this, you know, doctor told me I would never walk again does not take away from my willpower or my fight to walk again. Yeah. Right? It doesn't make me weak-minded. Right? Um, it actually helps me uh, be more, you know, um, more open-minded, uh, more y y more strategic, more um, you know, and in, 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 uh, inquisitive to figure out. Okay, if they say this is absolutely not going to happen, what do I need to do to make it happen? <laughs> Who do I need to talk to? What questions do I need to ask? Right, and and even you know within like issues within the community, like I hear people say, well. You know, the system, you know, is, is flawed. And you can say the system is flawed and be stuck and just say the system is flawed. Mm -hmm. Or you can say the system is flawed, learn how the system operate, ask the right questions, and figure out innovative solutions. Wow. I have a feeling this is who Leon was before this happened to you. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't I'll, let the 19-year-old fool you. Yeah. yeah. You persevere. You're a pillar of strength emotionally and physically. And I, I'm in awe to learn, you know, even still learn more about your story, but to see what you've done with it and how you've touched so many people's lives through your story. So I appreciate it. You decided to come on Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy and and just give us just give us all that you had. It, it's been such a real conversation. What y'all see here, this is such a real guy, and I've really enjoyed my time with you. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Hopefully, I get to come back and uh, get invited back. Of course, yes. <laughs> of course. So here on on Healing. Overflow with Dr. Toy's Social Work Podcast. This is what we do. We have some last drips, some last healing drips. I tell the audience, healing is uh, overflows onto others. And so when you heal, it overflows onto everyone else. You're doing that. Uh, you're doing that in such a large scale, in such a big way that I'm sure it's unimaginable for you. Um, you have the Hair Foundation. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. And then any other last healing drips you have that will just overflow onto yeah. our audience. So I'll get to the healing drips first. Okay. Um, there was a point in my life where I felt responsible for other people's healing. Mm. And I was trying to save people. I was exhausted, unhappy. I was frustrated with myself and frustrated with people. I didn't have the capacity to be as creative as I wanted to be. I didn't have the energy to really uh, actualize my vision. The moment I decided to heal myself and model healing instead of trying to heal other people, that's when I became a healer. Ooh. And so, you know, I just want to encourage people because oftentimes it's, you know, it's, it's the people who have experienced the most pain and, and, and hold on to the most brokenness, running away from their brokenness, trying to heal other people because it really feels good and it feels like it gives you a sense of purpose. But when you focus on healing yourself, it will completely change the trajectory and the quality of your life. Um, and so I just want to leave that and poured it all the way out on that one, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the hair foundation, the hair foundation is a byproduct of our collective healing journey as a city. Um, it is not a Leon Ford thing. Um, just like you know, me meeting with Detective Derbish wasn't a Leon Ford thing. There were so many people who had, had their hands on me and Detective Derbish and us meeting, just as there are so many people who have their hands on uh, the HERE Foundation. And so the HERE Foundation was created to build a stronger sense of community in Pittsburgh by focusing and empowering both police and community um, we have gotten a lot of support from the, the philanthropic community, uh, from the corporate community. I mean, every expert that you could think of in Pittsburgh is somewhat connected to the Hair Foundation, whether you know they're an expert in business or they're an expert in community. And by experts, I'm talking about, you know, there's some folks who have um, been incarcerated. You know, there's folks who are, you know, football coaches and cheerleading coaches all the way to, you know, uh, parents or executives. Um, it is really a community initiative, and I'm so grateful that so many people have, you know, leaned into the vision of healing and um, and support the Hair Foundation. And so we have an incredible board, um, very diverse board, and we're focused on um, building the uh, bridges within com uh, community and police uh, through three pillars, which are mental health, workforce development, and gun violence reduction. And so we fund leaders. Uh, I, I am very open and honest when I say I don't have all the answers. And so we listen to community and we know, you know, historically there are people who come and they listen to community and they start projects and the community may not be a part of those projects. So we listen to the community, but then we fund the community. We fund people within the community 
to lead their own projects. And so I think it's a really innovative vision and uh, we're just getting started. Oh, it's amazing work. It's amazing work. It's called HAIR, like H-E-A-R, okay? The HAIR Foundation um, is tremendous work. I mean, it's you and coming together with, a, you know, chief, the chief of police at the time and saying, this is what we're going to do and brought the whole community in. You really, truly do listen to the community. It's a, it's a fantastic way to give back. And it's, and it's that choice. It's that choice, again, that I'm so impressed with. So um, listen, y'all. I, I've enjoyed my time immensely. If you really want the details of the story and a speakable hope, he did not tell me to push this. I'm pushing it because I love the book. <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> for that. Very, he's very humble and would never ask me to do that. So I'm doing it because um, it, it really inspired me, you know, it, as a therapist and, and treating folks that have been impacted by trauma, it gave me another perspective and another insight. And so there's never a time where we stop learning and we and we stop, you know, getting better at what we do in servicing people. And so I I love it. The community and the in the way that you you call people to heal is tremendous. Um so thank you so much again Appreciate for coming it. here. Listen, y'all, every first and third Thursday, Healing Overflow with Dr. Toy. That's me, Dr. Toya Jones. I'm your host. Get here. Get on the link tree. Hit me up at toyaj at pit.edu. If you have questions for the Ask a Therapist segment, stay tuned. We're going to have plenty of those questions answered. Um, I'm not just advertising a Starbucks gift card, but these are questions that are so important, and I'm so glad that you are bringing them in. I'm getting them through the email and the Qualtrics link. I can't thank our, our guest enough for coming here um, and spending time to talk with us. So I hope you learned a lot. I hope you healed through his healing. I have healed through your healing. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And I will see y'all next time. Keep on healing so your healing flow. Did I just mess that up? Keep on healing <laughs> so your healing overflows onto everyone else. I nailed it that time. I'll see y'all later. Bye. Peace.